that Afghanistan is the most dangerous place in the world to be born a woman. It's said to be more dangerous to be a woman in Afghanistan than to be a man in combat. These women are surviving on the front lines. They are in combat. They're collateral damage. They're used as pawns of war. And almost every woman is hidden and isolated from the outside world. Just a few days ago, I was sitting in Afghanistan with a group of women from all over the country. I went with the intent of getting qualitative interviews, but what happened is I heard their stories on an intimate level. And every one of them was full of pervasive inequality and suffering. The Taliban enforced some of the most violent and egregious limitations on women's rights in modern statehood. And I know that this audience is clearly aware of the violations. As you know, restrictions were severely and brutally enforced. The consequences included public stoning for even being accused of adultery or dishonor. They've been physically tortured, beaten severely, burned alive or had acid thrown at them. They've had to marry at a very early age or raped and sold into prostitution, with many engaging in self-immolation as a result. I'll never forget meeting a woman who had deep scars from being brutally mutilated in front of her young daughter. The people I met with as they told me their stories Beg me to please tell people what's happening to us and what will happen if you leave. It breaks my heart because they're trusting that that truth alone will move the international community to take action. When a state cannot protect its people, organizations like ours are charged with providing aid to the most vulnerable and desperate. But we can barely operate in such an unstable environment and it will only get worse without military intervention. Over the last decade, tremendous strides have been made for Afghan women. And this is a testament to just how strong and resilient they are. But the situation in Afghanistan is at a pivotal and dangerous point as international forces, including the US, continue to reduce their presence and footprint, decisions and operations that are conducted today will directly affect the future security of the nation, the region, and the world. Have no doubt that there will be reduction in support for all state and NGO services following international troop withdrawals. And then as Afghanistan becomes more unstable, foreign aid will decline from the high benchmark of the previous decade over to a country that cannot afford to sustain most of the programs and the progress that have been created. And the women who took the chance to turn to state actors and mechanisms, NGOs, women's shelters, schools and jobs, they're gonna find it incredibly difficult and even dangerous to return to their former lives. The women I spoke with, they told me that they're afraid, they're quite sure that they'll be targeted to make an example of them. If international forces withdraw, there will be greater instability and violence against women in the coming years and much of the progress will be lost. We've heard today about the inspiring statistics, such as the high number of women serving in parliament and the new laws created to protect women's rights and human rights. But we must consider the current political, economic, sociocultural, religious, and tribal systems that hinder progress and put women at risk. Merely passing laws are not enough. This week, the women I spoke with said that they feel a disconnect from those perceived victories. They told me that they have absolutely no choice, options, or access to justice or finding support to assert their rights and interests. 
deeply ingrained societal norms dissuade women from being able to assert their rights. Many don't even know that they have rights or what their rights are. In most cases, reporting this abuse and violence triggers the loss of social and economic safety nets that the women must negotiate their lives through today. So we need to look beyond the laws on the books because women are finding them become irrelevant when local customs define prevailing norms. Even though today women should theoretically have equal rights under Afghan law, these legal protections are under, under enforced. And I got a glimpse of the challenges during my time in country. I was walking through a particular compound that support A&P vehicles, these are police vehicles, and I was shocked to see them mangled from explosions, from bombs. They were full of bullet holes. The A&P, unfortunately, are playing a combat role as they shoulder the burden to fight insurgency on the streets. I promise you, no woman is calling the police after she's been brutally raped and beaten. Another reason that many programs have failed women is I believe that funding for these programs are disproportionately earmarked for short-sighted, short-term projects that are indeed designed to lift women up, but disregard the cultural context of how to sustain such progress. And many gender-based interventions around the world have failed because they ignored the cultural authority structures. Right now, violations of women's rights are still far more likely to be resolved by community elders and forums. So to ignore their influence, especially given the potential weakening of state mechanisms and foreign aid, leave most women without any option to get help. And societal norms still legitimize violence against women as appropriate consequences for what's deemed bad behavior, and because violating taboos bring collective shame to the family, the women find themselves having no kind of safety net from even their own community, sometimes even seeing their own family helping enforce these judgments. An Afghan woman is going to weigh these potential consequences of her going out and working, sending her children to school, divorcing her violent husband, or trying to turn to the courts for justice in a very different way than a Western woman will. Remember, we are raised with an individual rights-based perspective, but an Afghan woman today will realize it's too dangerous to contravene societal norms. We cannot try to impose a traditional structure of justice without acknowledging an existing system that women are trapped in. So what's to be done? First and foremost, we must lend our voices to ensuring that security remains, that the investments, resources, sacrifices of our men and women in uniform and the sacrifices of the Afghan women are not wasted. In reality, this means that international forces must stay in Afghanistan so that we can collectively scale our efforts. And so that history doesn't repeat itself, there's a great need for civil, military, interagency planning, for sustainability, and we must ensure that women's rights are equally represented and fully understood. Research and experience show that simply including women in stability operations and developmental programs does not lead to women's security and empowerment. Providing women with new laws and maybe a few skills and then expecting them to conquer age-old injustices is ineffective and, as we can see today, dangerous. The women suffer the unintended consequences. If we want to sustain and further the progress that has been made, there needs to be sustained support and more emphasis in training and creating long-term, flexible funding arrangements. And overall, campaigns must broaden the focus to include existing structures, particularly men, to target the opportunities for change more strategically. We must recognize the complexity 
and nonlinear nature of progress in this environment. We are all here because of our commitment to protect women's rights and do whatever it takes to unleash their potential because we know that when we do, there are measurable benefits when it comes to security, productivity, child nutrition, maternal mortality, and literacy, all of the factors that ensure stability. And we know that when women succeed, Families succeed and they lift the community up right alongside them. Social issues that challenge communities around the world are no longer isolated. Considering the effects of rapid globalization and an ever-connected society, what happens internationally affect us here at home. And I believe it's imperative that we recognize the importance of humanitarian intervention around the world. As horrendous and unstable the situation is in Afghanistan, I have seen hope. We have a willing ally in Afghanistan that want peace and stability. I believe that if we can create a sense of security and solidarity, we will find a space to operate such programs that help people help themselves and ultimately help secure our shared future as well. Thank you.